All right, thank you everybody and welcome to uh, the uh, service provider panel we've put together today called uh, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of Open Source. Uh, we've got a couple of our esteemed guests here tonight uh, to talk about this, uh, about this uh, really interesting area uh, from uh, various uh, telco service providers. Um, so if, if you all could introduce yourself, uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, and uh, kind of what your uh, involvement in open source, open source networking, et cetera, uh, might be. Catherine, do you want to start? Yes, thank you, Tom. So I'm Catherine Lefebvre. I'm working for AT&T, um, in particular in the space of uh, network system, common framework and services. And in addition to that, I'm representing the ONAP community serving as their chair. So maybe Lucas, you want to continue? Yes, I'm uh, Luca Martini. I work for uh, Charter Communication, uh, mostly focusing on uh, network automation and uh, closed loop automation systems, and also network uh, automated management systems. And uh, I rely heavily on open source uh, to build those systems. And uh, go ahead, um, uh, Mohammed. Thanks, Luca. Uh, I'm Mohammed Zabetian. Uh, like Luca, I work for Charter Communication. Uh, my responsibility is uh, around the network function visualization and infrastructure uh, and edge cloud. Uh, I'm part of the CT office and we driving the next generation technology for Charter. Fantastic. Um, so I let me ask you, you guys, a question, and then you know. Uh, feel free, whoever wants to take it first, and we'll kind of go around the go around the wheel um, and get everybody's kind of take on this. But I wanted to start things off with maybe a little bit of a, a controversial question, potentially. Uh, have we gone too far um, in in developing um, uh, our own distributions and products? And and that's to say, to put a finer point on that is. Um, should we be buying distros of various open source projects from vendors, or should we be rolling them on uh, on our own? Um, so, what do you what do you all think about that? So, maybe maybe I can make a start. So, so I think we need to dissociate the type of open source that we are referring to. I think first of all, you have open source like Open Daylight, Docker, and Kubernetes, where we really take as a carrier the commercial version of it. We rely on it, and that's what we need. And then, in addition to that, we have uh, open source like ONAP, where as a carrier, we would like that uh, we contribute to a common platform that we define together, that will somehow meet different priorities uh, and feature needed for all the carriers supported by our 30 partners. 30 party vendors and integrator. And later on, we can build with our third party vendors services, adding our secret sauce to make the key differentiator between carriers and third party vendors. So that, that's my feedback to you, but maybe Mohamed or Lucas, you have different opinion? Well, <laughs> open source is- I'm sure is, they uh, do. Yes, uh, to a certain extent. Open source is, is open source, but it's not free. So there is a cost of maintenance and integration, whether we do that in house or uh, we buy it from somebody uh, th that is still work and needs to be done. And so I think uh, personally, I will look at all options and basically make a business decision on, based on the complexity of supporting a specific a piece of open source into my final system or buying the support from somebody who distributed like Red Hat and so forth, right? So so I make a business decision on, on what the cost is and it all depends. So if a vendor comes along and wants to sell me open source and it's incredibly expensive, that doesn't, doesn't fly, right? But for a certain, uh, you know, more reasonable uh, fees where you get a reasonable support, that then it's definitely I uh, will buy the support from somebody. Yeah, Mohan. No, I, I think uh, Luca explained very well and Catherine. The, the point, the, the major difference in my mind is uh, first thing: are we going to consume soft, uh, open source, or are we going to buy? Uh, you know, 
And then if comes to open source, you might be able to buy support from third party or you can't really buy a distro from the third party. And I think there is a distinguish between all three of them you know, in our uh, industry. In my mind, there, it should be a balance based on the risk and the value of that open source and the change we try to solve and ease of the integration or you know, make it deploy globally. That, that's going to drive a decision. Sometimes you just want an open source. You don't want to vend a distro, but you want a support for that open source. And I think a lot of times we end up to do that. And the Kesson example, is, is, which is a very important one in my, my own app conversation, we, we won't be able to influence, we won't be able to drive it, and then at our integration point or our in, in, in secret sauce to be able to leverage if we need it. And there are other examples of that. It's not just one app, there are other examples in the different parts of the R industry we do that. So just to take off on, on what you were just saying, so, so the key is finding a partner to, to, to either support and deliver that you can trust and rely on, or you have to, um, you're gonna have to do this yourself. And there's, I guess Luca made this point, right? There's no free lunch. You, somebody has to do this, right? And really one of the things, where really this boils down to two is another interesting thing around uh, what's happened in, in open source networking and other places too. But um, really what we're talking about is the disaggregation of software, right? That you're no longer buying everything in a tin can from one vendor, right? And the point I've been making, talking to customers for a couple of years now is there's no, exactly what Luca just said, there's no free lunch. Somebody has to reconstitute the, the thing after it's been, been ripped up into different parts. And that integration, um, you know, I've, I've built some pretty complicated products with Luca before, for example, that is a huge amount of, of, of resource effort to make that work right. And getting these components to work together is, is complicated. Um, so like Catherine, I think you, you had a, um, a finer point on that. Like you were talking about ONAP versus other projects. What do you, would you have examples of, you know, one or the other or, or the many different examples where you think like you would, you, you as an operator would try to pull this off on your own versus what you'd like to buy? Yes, and that's that's mainly what we did. So as you know, um, AT and T was really uh, the, the foundator with China Mobile of own app. So we we had a chance to have our own R and D. Uh, that's not the case of all the carriers. And we hope we contribute our code, our internal code, and then we start to build on top of that. So that was really a great experience because we were not only. Uh, you know, typically we just contribute to an open source co community, but here we were also sharing what we were doing and progressing with uh, key partners as well as our other uh, other carriers. And it was a great experience because we finally built this common platform. And they are still a key role for integrators and third party vendors. If you look at the ecosystem of ONAP, it has been really booming over the last two years. Um, and it's to support indeed the carriers who have not uh, the chance to have an R&D. They have probably tester and excellent uh, people working and knowing their network, but they still need to integrate all these components together with their OSS BSS uh, system as well. So, the, so that the, there's a backend integration remote. too. Yeah. That that has to happen anyway. Right? Yes. Anyway, yes. Yeah. And you need to do this productization. We try to do uh, with the community some, uh, uh, you know, looking after the non-functional requirement, which is key for the carriers as well as the security. But these are some gaps that an integrator can fill up completely when they do productization. And the other example you were mentioning is Open Daylight. In the context of AT&T, well, we were relying on an integrator to do this commercialization, to do this integration for us. Uh, inside our product as well. So that's that's really key uh, to have an integrator partners who is part of the adventure, so they understand our needs, and then later on we can rely on them and get support in production. Because the end goal is really production readiness. Cool. Do you, Mawa, Luca, do you have a take on that? Like, do you have, pro <laughs> do you have specific projects that, you know, upstream projects that, kind of to compare and contrast against own app, for example, that you would feel comfortable deploying versus ones that you wouldn't and maybe why? Uh, so maybe I could uh, 
say you know uh, Stackstorm has a, a fairly good support behind it and a fairly lively community, uh, which is you know something I consider a fairly well alive project. Open Daylight, on the other hand, uh, I'm not sure who's left to support it because all the company did that sure. went bankrupt. So, uh, of course, you still have a protection because it is open source. You can still keep going a little bit, but without a commercial entity behind it, <coughs> I'm not clear what the life of that project is going to be a long term. Uh, so that's one I would, uh, you know, keep a very close eye on. Cool. Mo, do you have a... No, I think the, uh, Catherine and Luca covered this uh, subject very well. At the end of the day, the problem we try to solve within the search for the environment is normally very complex. Own app or other uh, tools, they actually emphasize the challenge and, the, and emphasize we need to be able to actually integrate different open source to build the solution out of them. I think mm. if you look at the own app, it's not just one big monster, it's a lot of pieces together to get to that point. Yeah, and starting, and, and first of all, understanding the landscape of that monster is, is, is the, you know, is a challenge in itself. I mean, which, and we pick on ONAP. Have you looked at Kubernetes lately? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's the other one. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, there's a map, there's a, there's a group of people that maintain the map because there's so many pieces, parts to that project. Um, but, but Luca, you touched on a really important part, right? Which is the, the commercial life cycle of the different projects, right? And you know, like I that's one thing that I've been curious about. Like you you all as operators, how do you sort of insulate yourself against that? I mean, companies, you know, I mean, here's a here's a practical difference between a startup that's producing a distro and it might meet your criteria that you all talked about at the beginning. It might be priced right, supported well, et cetera. What if they just run out of steam, you know, and and all that? I mean, how how do you, you know, and I'm sure at and is a different way to do this thing than Charter uh, to handle this. So I'd like to, um, you know, kind of explore that a little bit. How do you kind of insulate yourself around against that happening? It definitely happens, right? Like against, you know, the demise of projects versus, you know, you left, you know, you're in production and a pro and a upstream project just goes poof, you know. And right. So first of all, it takes. <clears throat> Uh, some time for the project to completely die. Um, in general, what you end up is they, they, there's some kind of commercial entity uh, behind it that eventually fades and disappears, and then the project is open source, so the community keeps going for a while. What I've seen in a couple of projects, we've had some components of our uh, automation system that have died uh, over the past few years, and it, it takes uh, at least a year after the commercial entity has gone for it to completely die. So you have some time to move off to somewhere else. Again, there's no free lunch. So you have to invest into maintaining this, this uh, components. And so if a component dies, you have some time, but you have to make a plan to move off of it and move somewhere else. In our case, uh, one of the databases uh, that we were using was a, a spin-off of, of a different one and, and it died and, and so we took a while and then mm -hmm. we moved on to to a different one and now we're, we're off of it completely so you know again i think you, the the difference between the open source and the startup is in the startup you have you know maybe more focused and more uh, quicker support but there's a much higher risk because if it goes bankrupt then you you know, yeah, you put the code in escrow, that's what service providers do, and, and they receive the code, but... But who maintains it? Receive a code <laughs> a project, right? And and even if you hire some of the people that work on the project, it's still the code of a dead project. Yeah. And so, uh, again, uh, I think that's a little higher risk, in fact, than open source, because it can uh, you have to move off of it, and you have to replace <clears> it quicker <throat> than I believe you would do if it was open source. Cool. Catherine, do you have a... No, I, I think I'm aligned with what Lucas said um, in the sense that with open source, because you start also to bank under code um, into uh, third-party integrators or vendors, somehow you, you create your safety net 
because at one point your third party vendors can take it over because all the source code was available and can build what you need. So you can move from off the shelf uh, product to again customization if an open source is no more uh, supporting you in that case. Uh, with startup, again, we, we, we have similar process with escrow and, and noticed so we can reassess the market and see what other player uh, will be part of your next generation of architecture. So that's how we fix the problem typically. Cool. And Mo, do you have uh... I think I think the, I agree with uh, both of uh, Catherine and Luca. When we're talking about a startup, if, especially if, when it's uh, not open source, it's just uh, you know they still use actually the, their product. You want to if there is something here. The thing that the problem is going to be sometimes they come with the idea, nobody else has it, and it's very valuable. At that point, you're going to try to a slow a slow roll with that per organization, figure out what's going on, see the value. But it's going to be a very slow movement to the production or, or depend, building dependency within our environment uh, and make sure it's not just us uh, and there's a, con uh, there's a larger group of the companies that have the same interest. You know, it's kind of come down to the due diligence. Uh, but the problem, as you say, and uh, Tom, is it's a high risk with those companies at the end of the day. So we, we're going to try to partner with other larger companies to see what we can do or not. I personally, I believe, uh, as Luca said, open source is a lower risk in generic term than those, those kind of startup. Uh, but it's, it's just my perspective. Yeah, I guess it's yeah. I mean, that's that's a good way to look at it. It's you know the pros and cons, right? I mean, like with startups, it, service providers typically require them to be indemnified, right, by some mm -hmm. other larger partner, right, to support it and carry on. Right, but right. why is that? That's in some ways, it's not any different than if it's a closed source startup, right? I mean, it's it could go poof. Maybe you have more sources to work on their software if the project continues, but it's still a it's a due diligence situation. You have to have a plan, right? Um, and in fact, it's the same thing if you're working at like you know Catherine's you know own app example. AT and T's you know is publicly stated they consume own app, et cetera, et cetera, and they use the project if the project dies, you know, someday down the road, somebody still has to maintain it. So you, you better have a plan, right? I mean, to carry on with that at some point or, you know, diverge on something else. But in some ways, it's really, is that any different than a than a vendor uh, thing you buy in a tin can? Mm, depends, right? I guess. And, and that leads us to the next question, right? Is, is, um, you know, we've had a series now of cycles in this space now in the last, I don't know, whatever, 10 years, um, you know, six years where we've had some pretty significant projects. We've had OpenStack, for example, which is still here, but it was a pretty massive project at the beginning. And it's kind of on the other side of the curve and it's tapered down to kind of a maintenance stability situation. Um, but it's still here. There's There are vendors that sell it um, and it works and all that. But that's still going to have a taper at some point off into into nowhere. And so you need a plan. But, um, you know, my point is we've seen a bunch of these now. And, and so, like, is your conclusion as operators, you know, should we go back to a vendor-led situation where they're providing the whole integrated enchilada for you? Or are you, you, you folks still okay with kind of what we've been talking about? That one is going to be more costly, costly in my mind because when you go fully vendor driven, then here's the reality: you you are in you you, you have limited more you have limited options after that, and that's the most the change when you are completely single vendor or like you have a whole on of you save from one vendor. That's that's it's, it might be a very large vendor, and at that point, you know, maybe the risk of vendor goes down or go bankrupt or poof is lower. But your influence to get what you need as a search warrior to actually drive your business and and do the different evolution of that product is going to be very much tied to the vendor roadmap and what the vendor is going to commit to you to deliver to you. So, But there's still a risk, you're saying, and, in, and in that, every situation. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's, and actually, sometimes it became a bigger risk because it's going to impact your agility and, and ability to mm -hmm. move forward. 
Yeah. Catherine, Lucas? Yeah, I was just thinking that typically you don't bank only on one uh, vendors. Uh, you probably have a larger scope and then you will define the suitable vendors for, for building your end-to-end -end scope. But you will not only rely on one vendors to avoid typically the problem that we are raising here. So uh, we know that most of uh, some of the vendors are playing in the same area. So you, you will start to negotiate with all of them. And uh, well, if you look a little bit what we did uh, with our cloud, when we decided to run away from private and move to the public cloud uh, for the non-network workload, uh, we, we look at Azure, we look at IBM, we look at Amazon, but we will not only rely on one uh, cloud provider. Uh, that's just an example, but typically that's what we do also for the solution to support our network or solution to support uh, IoT. We, we have uh, a selective uh, third party vendors. Uh, we are used to work together and we are building solution in this space together. Cool. Luca? I don't have much else to add to this particular one. <laughs> so. so, so Catherine, let me ask you a, a follow-up on what something you just said, right? And this is for you guys to uh, on Luca. You brought up a good point, right? The multi-vendor thing. That used to be a form of insulation, right? You would have a lead vendor and then a secondary in case they screwed up or you could pressure them for prices and all that, right? The usual thing. Um, so I guess the, the question is like, uh, and I, I'm encountering this kind of from the other side from, you know, I'm, I'm running a, uh, a, an integration, uh, of, of a sorts like this. And I'm interested to hear is, is, is that really a viable way to do this in the open source configuration in a sense, do you really need multiple vendors or does it make it worse? You know, and I'll give you an example, like like the five G VRAN stack today. Um, you can you can start at the bottom and say, okay, I'll have two hardware vendors. That's easy. Then I, but suddenly you get to the point where, like, you know, how many platforms do you need underneath that? You know, mm -hmm. how many Kubernetes do you need, say? And then the workloads on top of that. You know, how many workloads do you need up here too? You know, to get the service that you're trying to sell. So that's, you know, I mean, I'm interested to hear what you guys think about that. Yeah, I think from the infrastructure, uh, uh, even if we have the multi vim concept, right? What it is important is that the solution become agnostic uh, from your vendors somehow, because we, we, we are running away from uh, a premises. We, we have been moving to the virtualization. Now we are speaking about the containerization. So we have disagreemented the Y, fine, we moved to Y box, disagreemented the network. Um, so this level, you know, uh, this transformation, running away from premises funded by a particular vendor and moving to this uh, virtualization and our containerization have opened the door. And I think we have somehow, uh, there are still some vendor locking for some solution, of course, and that's why sometimes carriers are locked to them. But mm -hmm. we, it's so more open now that we have a, a bright range of uh, opportunities. And if we look at ONAP, we can see the vendors are working together. In the 5G area, we, we, see, we see Nokia, Ericsson working, teaming up. We saw also this type of teaming up with, with Intel, IBM, in other space, and Oran as well. So they are really teaming up. That's how they appear to us. They are teaming up and they provide some 5G uh, services and they know which one they will sell it uh, independently. But we but see I, a real teaming up because they are the open source is a prototype environment. They can try working together and also working with us. So, so having this experimental environment before selling us their commercial version of it it's also key because they can taste what will be your needs uh, yep. before really we move to the commercial uh, version. So I think this evolution from premises uh, virtualiz to cloud and uh, having the virtualization to containerization 
open reading a new way of building a business. Fantastic. Yeah. Luca Mo. So what are you guys thinking in that in that space? So I'm going to go back to actually probably the, uh, your original question and the way I see it. When, when we're talking about uh, multi functions, multi, uh, multi tools for the same function, let's just call it this way. Uh, when we're talking about uh, like uh, orchestration or Veeam, in, if you look at the NFVSX, so we might have a, is it makes sense to have a, three, three, three different Veeams or three different uh, a stack of Kubernetes. Uh, the reality is, it, every time you add uh, one new vendor or, or open source tools in the same function, what you do is you immediately uh, increase your complexity. That's that's given, you know, that because you you're going to have it in, in hand. You're going to have a more a new sets of the vulnerability uh, outages. Uh, I mean, uh, bugs, other things as part Two of Two is that. more than one, right? And they may not yeah. be the same version all the time, and they all of these messy details, right? And integration and the, together. Integration, yeah. just a chance. Yeah. So, so before that, I think anybody wants to do that, you need to accept set, sets of rules, like how you communicate for to, for that function. The, the acceptable set of, set of APIs or whatever is you man, your manner of the communicating to that tools, to that function, regardless, regardless of the tools. If you can get that and that communication manifest communication to that function for regardless of on what, is, what is underlined, then you can talk about having more than one if you are ready as an organization to accept those changes within that uh, multi tools for the same function or multi vendor or open source for that function. Uh, it's, it's, it's a business decision and it's, it's, that's the risk management. You know, you and you decreasing the risk of the uh, open source or vendor goes barely up with having multiple, but in the, in the same time... But you, you have to manage it, is what you're saying. You need to it's manage free, it, you need yeah. to be able to build the interface to communicate to different ones, and also you need to accept the fact you have more set of uh, bugs, other things might happen. Because it's so let complex. me ask you this question, kind of, you, you both have, have hit on the same kind of thing. Are operators taking on the role of, of, of software integrator? going forward with open source. Is that really what we're talking about? Or, or do you have to outsource it? But should this be a, it sounds like it, because you guys are basically saying this, but should this be a, a defined role that the operator now has to explicitly spell out somehow? Actually, so let me put it this way. Um, I There has to be a value, a business value brought by open source and a business value brought by a vendor. If my, the system I'm trying to build requires me to do 80% of the code, right? There's very little value brought on by, you know, 20% of the code out of a project, right? So whether it's so in that case, open source might be able to fit because the, the support cost for that particular piece is going to be limited, and I have to invest heavily. Not I wouldn't even say integration. This is not integration. This is custom code built on specific platform, right? Yeah. Um, integration, you know, if it's done well, it's easy. I mean, I wouldn't go and put Linux together. I would just go get, you know, some Linux distribution, right? Yeah. Now, but when, but I, I end up with situations where it really doesn't work and a vendor comes along and goes, my platform does anything you want, just code it. And okay, but now I have to invest heavily in a proprietary right, because what are you paying for at that point? <laughs> Not only it's very expensive sometimes, they, they but then I have to do all the coding, and I was like, no, you know that doesn't work. If that's the case, that means your platform does everything, but it doesn't do anything useful. It doesn't do anything useful for you? <laughs> a, that is actually a perfect comment Luca made. There is a, their vendors sometimes come and say we do everything, and they cannot do anything really right. And back to your question. Yes, we end up to do a lot of uh, software integration or code integration because the reality is we are building puzzles. There is a blueprint uh, to deliver the certain function. At that point, you're going to build that puzzle and you need to integrate those pieces together to deliver that what you intend is. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, anything we're talking about, there is intent for doing it and we need to be able to deliver that intent. And I, 
I might not be educated enough, but I haven't seen anybody can deliver our intents as a one vendor solution. We have a lot of pieces they need to behave and work together to, to do that intent, regardless of the, what is that intent. And that's, that's a change. And, but I, I come back on what Lucas said since the beginning. You need to understand the return on investment and assess buy versus build, building yourself. And when, when it, you as make this assessment for any solution you want to, to buy or build, then you know where you go. So buy versus build, it's probably what the car, any carriers is doing. Um, just to be sure, because at the end, they, are, they have a clear idea of what they want. But the solution, there are so many on the market. And you can also build yourself. Mm. So the return on investment is a key word. Sometimes. So the business, the business angle is really critical to this, you know, and, and, yeah. and the details, really. There's, there's, yes. another, there's another angle. I want to invest my development cycles into unique things that will give me an edge or against the competition in the market. So I don't want to necessarily go and do things like create something I can go buy off the shelf, right? It's faster for me to go do that. Uh, I want to invest where it, it goes innovation and service in, in, in uh, you know, fulfilling possible. That's real value. As opposed saying, to, right? you know, but reproducing. So, so uh, that's another side uh, as well, which, which we heavily consider in, you know, a build versus buy uh, situation. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's got to add real value to the to the party, or it, you know, what are you doing? You know, just just building it because you can doesn't mean you should, right? Cool. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Mo. Do you have a... No, the only thing I want to say, and the problem is for most of us, uh, we don't have a lot of programming or software people. We have to use them as a wise way. We cannot just throw resources at the problem and then we can't solve it. That's what like. Yeah, they're expensive. Yep. Yeah. No, that's cool. Um, so we're we're up against the uh, the the half hour here. Do you, do you just kind of want to go around the the uh, the Brady Bunch squares here with any closing thoughts, um, Catherine? You want to go first? No, I think that uh, what I would like to highlight it's really we it's a partnership at the end. It's not uh, the carrier is king and the vendors is is selling their solution. Uh, everything had to happen uh, with with our partners, and that's how we we are able to build uh, the best solution uh, to deserve our customers. Cool, Mo. You have any closing thoughts? At the end of the day, our goals and most of the time align with our partner, which they are our vendors or uh, which we work with our vendors. Uh, they're always going to be challenged, which is part of the you know. <laughs> having the, having a lot of pieces to put together and relationship we have with everybody. But I think at the end of the day, the goal for everybody is to be able to deliver value to their companies and to the service provider. Oh, okay. So um, the closing thought, I, um, you know, open source has a cycle, a life cycle, but there's also part of a life cycle is the uh, quality, the seniority of the coders behind that particular project. You know, I, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that we used to start out with Zebra and then we went to Quagga and then we went to Bird and so forth, in, you know, mentioning one particular routing project. It doesn't mean because, you know, everybody goes over to the next one that it actually is better. I have situations where I actually have some of the best people that used to work on pieces of Linux, which were fairly important. They're working for us at Charter now. And those pieces of Linux are not improved since they quit. They, uh, you know, so I would say one of the things that's very important is the governance of a project. Uh, they, a lot of people want to go there and make a mark, but it doesn't mean that that project is, uh, is improved. So, so that's something that really I, I would uh, look at the major open source integrator like Red Hat to uh, keep a, a close eye and, and on the governments on these projects so that we get we move forward and we don't you know move backwards. Well, it's like you said, right? So we have projects that do stuff that's useful, not just do stuff. <laughs> you know, yeah. cool, fantastic. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, everybody. And um, I want to thank thank our, our esteemed panelists today. And, uh, um, and thanks, Veronica, for helping to uh, facilitate the